I always wanted to ask you. I don't think I, th I, th I think it came up when we were doing uh, ECQC. But like, is the experience you get from the Canadians starkly different from like the Americans or or, or other kind of nations you go to? The aggression trigger than, than Americans. Not by much, but I think uh, I think it's definitely there. It's something cultural. I think overall, when I look at the, the you know self-defense-minded people coming in to do this coursework, I uh, think that Canadians are definitely a little bit slower in the trigger. Yes, overall. That's yeah. Hard. Yeah. Interesting because I mean we're you know we're right beside each other, so you wouldn't think we would would be uh, that different. In that sense, you know, you wouldn't think there would be too much shift. Yeah, but you know, if you think about topography and how densely populated the two countries are, I, I think that's going to. Yeah, uh, yeah, actually, that would make sense, wouldn't it? I think, um, <laughs> ge I mean, geographically, where Canada is so huge, everyone's very far apart. Um, we've got a lot of, a um, lot of, lot of, yeah, a lot of, lot of small town kind of communities yeah. here. Um, like where me and Chris, we grew up, the town had like, for like eight to 10,000 people when we were growing up in it. So, um, and that's, and that's definitely a different experience than, than city living, you know? Um, we don't have yeah, a lot. I would even go as far, for, I would even go, go as far as to say that I think Canada overall has a great sense of old school community than the U.S. does. I think so. Interesting. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, we don't have a lot of cities here, and the ones the ones we have, there. I mean, we've got a couple big ones, but most of them are, are like a million people or less. You know, we don't have um, a lot of that. Are, I mean, like the the sprawl of Canada makes it so everyone's pretty pretty thinned out in most of the nation. You know. Um, I, I, I figure anybody who will see this work that I'm doing right now will know who you are, but just in case they don't, can you just drop your usual snapshot of who you are and what you do, and then we'll just go from, go right into it from there? Yeah, so my name is, uh, Craig Douglas, I am a retired police officer from, uh, the southern U.S., uh, specifically the state of Mississippi, right on the Gulf Coast, you can't get any further south. <laughs> and I, did a, I did a total of 21 years on the job. Uh, most of the time, specifically 11 out of 21 years, was spent working as a narcotics agent, and two of those 11 were spent certainly uh, working in an undercover capacity. So uh, I've spent, uh, I'll spend 12 years on the SWAT team, running the SWAT team, FL patrol uh, assignments, uh, correctional assignments. Uh, regular detective assignments and, uh, you know, spent a career in law enforcement and decided to enter the private sector uh, as a full-time firearms and uh, tactics instructor, self-defense instructor. And my specific specialties, I guess, are entangled weapons-based uh, delivery systems. So they, how do you get a gun or a knife out in a clinch or a ground fight or how do you utilize or how do you defend yourself against a gun or a knife in a, uh, a clinch or a ground fight? So those, those are probably the areas that I've known the most of before. Yeah, you um, you popped up on the scene for me with re reverse edge methods like way back in the day. Um, right. Do you uh, do you still stand by those those videos and that coursework specifically? Like, if somebody was to watch those today, would you still say like, yeah, that's 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 good stuff? It's a little dated. Uh, I wasn't as invested in clinch work when I did those videos. Um, but things like a knife jam, things like using the inner edge to hook and shear, yeah, that stuff. Uh, and, and it's probably, it's not that, it's not that uh, the stuff in the videos is, is bad or I don't believe that anymore, but it, it, it would definitely be probably a... Uh, a different delivery system than where the knife comes out has changed a little bit. Yeah, like you're probably your 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 perspective of of teaching it has changed. I imagine. It has, you 
know, it, it really has. You know, the more time I spent, I, I had a pretty good handle on citizen self defense, at least from a, a solitary, single law enforcement perspective, not working under color of authority. But arguably, you know, that was was me going and looking for trouble as an undercover officer. Buying drugs, <laughs> yeah. Things like that. So, Getting into the shit. Yeah. And the kinds of circumstances citizens are faced with when they're assaulted and ambushed. So, the uh, more time I spent teaching in the private sector uh, and, and the more I started to, to delve into the appropriateness of vertical and horizontal grappling and providing a consistent delivery system to an end state that I figured out basically just a fight club. You know? Yeah. Um, but the more the curriculum started to change. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, it became less of because um, I remember um, I remember asking you about this. It's funny because um, I have a friend who 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 loves reverse edge methods. Like he he loves like those those videos. Cause I le- I lent them to him. And the, and it was it was almost like the only thing he took away was that you're supposed to use the inner edge, and I was like, well, that's not really the point. Um, and, I, and, and I tell you, Cody, it's interesting that you say that because you know you gotta remember the knives came out first before the DVDs came out, and before I started doing a road show, what kind of brought me to the forefront of the national scene in the U.S. were people on internet forums who had expressed an interest in using a knife the way I was uh, suggesting, which was backwards. And then uh, custom knife makers getting on board and saying, hey, you know, that sounds interesting and different, would like to collaborate with So the knives came out first, and then the knife DVDs came out second. So that, that really preceded my road show. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, like, there's a ton of, anyone who's done ECQC and EWO will, will get that sense of consistency between the two, you know what I mean? Like, the, yeah. like the holistic kind of mindset behind developing all of them. Yeah, I think I've done, you know, a much better job over the past 13 years that I've been doing over and training of really trying to, to achieve congruency with all the coursework. And, you know, I mean, I, I had 20 years of academy instruction before I, uh, you know, decided to, you know, hang shingle out of the private sector. But, yeah. You know, the one, one thing the private sector gave me was, was a lot of new, interesting, highly motivated people from, from very diverse backgrounds. The law enforcement had kind of been, you know, a, a homogenous group that I was working with. Now, you know, I've worked with people much older, much younger, who are not involved in law enforcement, men, women, you know, uh, uh, people with, with severe disabilities, people who are physical specimens, you know, such a, the, the, the open enrollment side gave me so much, um, so much variability and also so much more frequency, you know, now I go from teaching an academy class over a quarter to doing it literally a couple of times a month. So the sheer, the sheer volume really went a long way towards, you know, getting me, you know, changed over earlier and, and, and the rapid growth, which is what I did. 
Yeah. Um, you have, you know, the the concept of the the multidisciplinary tactician is that is that like your your the, your main theme now? It really is, man. Teach people, you know. And I, I, I probably I'm not really a general, but you know, I, I like people, long term students of mine. You know, and I, I shouldn't really use the word students. I'm a long term patron now because you guys take my rules. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. You know, literally. But, you know, I like guys like you to be uh, very, very, very good to have good Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, excellent wrestling, be able to shoot like a USPSA grandmaster, have <laughs> the nice skills of a, uh, of a high level colleague guy appropriately contextualized, and, and to have, you know, the, the, the verbal agility of a, of a good stand up comic. You know, I really like people being effective problem solvers and solving problems appropriately, yes. Would you say um, that the average, like, the, the really average people, um, when they do ECQC, do they get as much or more out of doing your work than, say, the guys who come in with, like, some MMA and that sort of thing? I think it's more profound for them. You know, I think the... Uh, and I'm a big fan of my coursework providing a lot of deep moments of introspection and contemplation. That's usually on the heels of, of a catastrophic failure. Yeah. You know? um, and I think people need that experience for change. Um, so I think for them, guys that don't have an MMA background or not used to contact sports and combat sports, yeah, I think it is more profound, but they also seem to be at the same time the ones who the coursework has the most impact on. You know, those are the guys who come back a year later and I don't even recognize because they've lost 50 to 80 pounds. Yeah. You know, they've gone from being a fat gun guy to, you know, very fit, very strong. They, they look different. Their bodies change. And they're just, I mean, they're just better overall. Man. Those are the do you think that's um when somebody goes through a change like that it's 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 not usually out of fear either like it's out of like a general drive for for, for that self improvement you know what I mean like they got a taste and now it they is, want more. Yeah. And and but I can deny what what took place. I, I think what people appreciate about the coursework, whether they like how it makes them feel, I think no one that's taken my coursework would say that it's not honest. It's yeah. Not an honest experience. And I strive to give people that honest experience. I think that's very lacking in a lot of martial arts instruction and a lot of law. Uh, Modern self defense methods, I think there's just a, a you know, there's a there's a distinct lack of honesty. You may not like what happens, yeah. but I did provide you an honest experience and really the onus is on you now to decide what you want to do with it and where you want to go from here. And I think that's I think people appreciate that really. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Like, um I remember when I so when I, I don't remember how, but I, when I stumbled across the reverse edge method stuff, it was when I just got out of, like, I, I was in, like, my, I just got out, I'd almost just gotten out of high school, basically, and I was done with traditional martial arts. I'd been burned by, I felt, I felt um, b betrayed a little bit um, by the way that all my traditional martial arts had just basically done nothing for me. Um, I just started hanging out with with uh, Chris and them, and we were hanging out doing like Muay Thai and wrestling and and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and stuff. And I was I felt like I was finally getting like the real picture of, of fighting. Um, and and I, you know I was reading Bruce Lee books and all that kind of thing, and and I was uh, just trying to get trying to get the truth rather than what somebody wanted to tell me about fighting. You know what I mean? Um, and that stuff really, I, when I when I looked at it, I was like, okay, this guy, this guy has the right idea. I think you know, what I mean? like this guy's onto something. Sure. 
Um, you know, it was very, uh, it was very fight clubbish in those days. Yeah. You know? I mean, it was, you know, I, I never, uh, there was no marketing plan on doing any of this. You know, people asked and people uh, connected, you know, and, and, and everyone wanted to come together for this common experience, but I just kind of, you know, facilitated. <laughs> and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Know? And which is cool. Yeah, it's very organic and how it grew, but yeah, I still think of it like that. I really do. It's, it's still very um, garage ish to me. Yeah, it is. Know, it, it's the essence and the heart of it and the, the guys, especially guys like you that have been on board for a decade, you know? I mean, those are the guys that, that know and I think carry on the. Uh, the tone of what we do. And I think that's real important. You know, I, I like people like you to carry that message, you know, and, uh, you know, that's how we grow it. Very organically and very, you know, one, one patron at a time. That's right, because, uh, you know, like, um, I showed up to, uh, like, you know, the Canadian Shipworks thing back in, like, 2007 or 2008 with uh, Chris Anderson and them out there in East, and uh, and now you're coming now you're coming to town. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, now, uh, man, it's just so freaking, it's so freaking busy. I mean, I'll 32 open enrollment classes and five government classes. Yes. <laughs> So, so are you when you're when you're not teaching um, on the weekends? Are like is are most of your weeks during the year taken up with doing this sort of thing too? Like teaching in an official capacity? No, you know, usually my typical work week, like for example, is you know I'll fly like I'll fly out to North Dakota tomorrow. Um, so I'm doing an ECQC in North Dakota this weekend. So I'll fly out tomorrow. I'll get in. Uh, late in the evening, and uh, I'll have, you know, Friday day and kind of out, you know, take a look at the site that we're teaching at, and then I'll start teaching Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, and fly back Monday. So, you know, when I'm working, you know, my work week is essentially Thursday from Monday. Yeah, and yeah. Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday are my, my Saturday, Sunday, and that's usually enough time for me to get a workout or two in, roll a couple of times, repack the gear, do my laundry, and do it again the next week. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, like a a pretty um, a pretty pretty heavy pace. Some some months, I would think. It is, man. But I tell you, dude, I uh, I love what I do. I love people. You know, the people that uh, people that, that came out for ECQC and come out for ECQC changed my life. I mean, they really did. Um, and an entire world that I wouldn't have had that there for them. You know, and ultimately, they are my patrons and made. You know, my life is pretty damn comfortable. So uh, that's that's really important to me that I continue to connect with those guys like you and, uh, you know, do the good work and, and grow the good thing. I'm a believer in this community. They're the best people in the world. Yeah, I, I, I opine all the time that the best people I know in the world, the most well adjusted people in the world, are the ones that come out on the weekends and punch each other in the face and shoot each other with simulations around. I mean, it's just, you know, they're, they're, they're the calmest, most well adjusted, most adaptive people I know. They're very, very cool. It just, it, it's just a fascinating crew, crew. You know, you can never look at a guy uh, and tell what's working on, up under him. You just can't do it. Yeah, you know, you it's really true. Look at a person and know what's going to come out. It's still, the human laboratory aspect of this all still fascinates me. It really does. When uh, when you were when you were making like building the Shivworks brand from from start to now, um, has there has there been any like major change in your attitude towards doing it, or was it just kind of like okay, now we're going to do this, and and now we're going to focus on this, and like did you have a game plan sort of or You know, I just, I, 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 I kind of, man, I kind of run my business kind of like the same way I thought to. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I, 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 I'll say, yeah, it's a dope deal, which is just, do I have a good feel for this or not? And if I have a good feel for it, I do it. If I feel like the people I trust, you know, have a good sense of it, I'll go along with that. You know, it's just a uh, very organic like that. I, I don't make calculated business decisions. You know, I just, and that's probably the wrong 
always want to visit so far. I'm sure somebody would tell you that, but I wouldn't. It, it, it's worked real well. I mean, so far, it's worked just trusting my gut about how to do and what to do. I mean, I, for example, I've had some, I've had some opportunities to blow my, my brand up, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and there was something either about the people that were, that were offering, you know, these, these options or just the way it was coming across it. That I just didn't care for. You yeah. Know, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be represented that way or I didn't want to, uh, you know, I just didn't want to go that route. And I checked fire and decided not to. You know, I, had a, I had a very lucrative video deal that I just didn't feel right about. You know, and yeah. decided to take, to take a pass on that. And so subsequently, years later, I'm right about, uh, you know, my gut. <laughs> Yeah. That's kind of what I did. Um, so if you stayed doing what you're doing now until whenever you decided to retire and like and and pass it on or or whatever the plan is, like if you stayed doing this for however long for you know like twenty, thirty years, would that be enough for you? Is that is that kind of the idea? I think you know there's some things I want to do. Uh, there, there, there are a couple of things I want to. I, I may very well end up doing. Some kind of instructor program that's formalized. You know, I have I have given five people instructor paper. You know, um, I was there when Chris LeBlanc uh, got his. Yeah, I gave Chris LeBlanc his. You know, and that was and that was a very old school kind of like a almost like a Mencio Kaiden type thing. It was very it was very personal. You know, what I wrote and and his richest certification. They say different things because they're different people. Yeah. You know. And, Would you say, um, would you say, like the, the landscape of the tactical training, like in I don't want I don't want to say industry, but I suppose it is an industry. Would you say that the landscape of the tactical training industry has changed since you got involved? Like, has there been any like major shifts in it? It, it hasn't flows, man. I think a lot of it has hasn't with the board. You know, um, we 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 saw you know probably you know from two thousand four to twenty ten a huge emphasis on carving skills or things like that. Now as the world winds down, you know, and, and CCW springs up around the U.S. at least, you know, you're seeing a lot more emphasis now on, you know, guys dressing normally and drawing from concealment. So I, I think you know, little, stuff like that, trends like that, you see more often than not. Vehicle work is starting to uh, get popular again. Um, I think that can be very personality driven and I think social media goes a long way towards making something popular or not popular. There's some uh, there's some Instagram famous dudes uh, that it's arguable whether they should be teaching or not. There's some Instagram famous dudes <laughs> doing stuff that's very similar to what I do. Yeah. You know. At least, you know, it, it's similar in that they're they're supposed to be entangled shooting solutions. Um but so that started to kind of pick up a little bit. Um, but I, I think that, I think between the war, social trends, and then what social media does for particular personality in this industry, and you're very right, by the way, question whether this is an industry or not. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well said. I mean, you know, you do anything you want, hang a shingle out and say, I'll do this. Yeah. Probably somebody will pay you to do that at this point in time. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think those drive the trends in the industry. I think they do. I think they do. Is there, um, are there any, like, major... Mi- misunderstandings in like the training like reality reality based whatever like I don't know what guys like to call it these days um, are, are there any major under- understandings in that sphere that you wish would kind of go away uh, you know I don't necessarily go away I, I think you know I really don't care what people do with your time or their money I really don't I, you know it's a, it's a America is certainly a free country. Canada is too. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's free if. Do whatever you want and pay whatever you want to engage in that, in that activity. I think you should do it. I, I'm very living let live. Now, I will say this. I will say if what you're espousing is self defense, then I may quibble about that. I may say, you know, Based on my experience, that, that's not appropriate for self-defense. You can do whatever you want to do, but understand that if you're thinking about this as self-defense, well, that's really that's really not appropriate. But you know, I don't, I don't, I don't police the industry. You know, I don't. I yeah. Really don't, man. I'm the cool guys do. I'm too busy doing what I'm doing and, and focusing on the people that are coming to me. You know, to to really worry about what the rest of the industry is doing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you uh, um, do you have any real worries about people like kind of piggybacking off of you and and taking your content and, and that sort of thing? Like I know there's guys out there who probably saw you pop up the, pop up on the scene, saw you blow up, and then were like, "Oh shit, we we should start doing that too." Sort of thing. Do you ha- is, has that been like a, a like a big issue for you or like a major concern? Nobody, nobody's, nobody's really doing what you're doing the way you're doing it. You know what I mean? Pretty well. 
to get the gun out and get rounds of him without being fouled. Now, 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 this is before we really had wrestling. This is before we really had Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. What yeah. we did was we figured out where we needed to be, and then wrestling and Jiu-Jitsu came later as viable, consistent methods to get to that end state that we had figured out from Fight Club. Yeah. And you said, oh, this is a, this is a, this is a skill set we can plug in here, basically. Exactly. Right now, right now, because I've been in that three years of work, anybody can come along and go and watch me say, all right, guys, the timing rule of Inside Weapons Access is control when the answer is closest to the gun before you go for the gun. And they can say, well, yeah, that's easy. Well, it's easy when somebody tells you the answer to it. It's easy when I, when I give you a consistent strategy template to get there, but it damn sure wasn't easy when this just didn't exist before. Yeah, when nobody was digging this, this deep, really. Nobody was really plugging in, staying in contact with the guy and, and trying to shoot. Nobody was really doing that. I think... I, I, yeah, I, I'll say I think Rob Pekas did was one of the few guys that's probably working in that area as far as trying to stay close to somebody and shoot versus striking and disengaging. Yeah, I think he was working at Val Hollow with a program um, similar to mine, but the time rule was not something that he picked up and figured out. Okay, they had some other solutions, not the specific timing rule of loom control, and then later on using wrestling as a way to do that with a duck under an arm drag. Yeah. You know? So, again, I go back to the, amount, the sheer amount of work and research that I've put into this. You know, I, I think for somebody to be competitive with me, besides just sheer copying what I do, they're going to have to put in some kind of equivalence. <laughs> right, right. I, I mean, it all just, um, it, it, looks, it looks like a deflated version of, of your work, a lot of it. Uh, and, you know, it just, from when I see it, I'm just like, hmm, I wonder if this guy's trying to rip Craig's stuff, that sort of thing. Yep. Yep. You know, um, yep. it doesn't, and it doesn't... You know, even, and, and, and even guys that rip my stuff from the vid, from, from video or whatever, okay, well, that's fine. But the guys that are doing it from the vid, from the video or whatever, okay, well, that's fine. But can you, can you explain this to me why it works? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't... Well, why we don't use other methods. Yeah, they, it, they don't really have that, that, that density, you know what I mean? You that's, you know, and that's what uh, I rely on, you know, to, you know, keep you busy, you know, and not, you know, uh, and, and again, I don't worry about, I mean, that hopefully somebody may will come out with something better than what I do. I don't think it's out there, and I know that's a bold thing to say as far as a tangled hand that shoot, but I do believe in what I do, and I believe I've spent more time in this field of study than probably most anybody. I wasn't the first guy doing it by any means. But at this point, as far as you know, uh, frequency and intensity, I, I would I would pick my body of work against anyone. It's it's funny you mention that be. because I think about I actually I think about this relatively often. Um, like you get a lot of that humility from guys where they're like, oh well, you know, I'm mine, I'm mine's just another style and. And you know, I don't want to say it's better than anybody else's. Like, I, I, I really want the guy who is confident in what he's doing and can tell me why it's better than what everybody else is doing. Um, like, and, like. And I, and I say that with no humorous, and I say that, and, I, and I'll qualify that statement. So like, I don't know what everyone's doing. I mean, I, there's, it's impossible to me. Yeah. To, you know what everybody's doing. There could very well be someone out there that has figured out a better way to do this than I am. There, there, there well could. I'm, I'm not seeing training schedules. I'm not seeing course reviews. I'm not seeing anything on social media that, that is an equivalent, you know, uh, is an equivalent uh, model. I just don't see it. Would you, um, uh, look, like when you look at, your past coursework, um, like for example, the way things have changed from even like say like 2008 to now, is there um, like that's that stuff? Would you, would you go back and and reteach it differently if you had the opportunity, or would you just say no? Those guys, those guys had the best picture, you know, that we had at the time, sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think. Well, I, you know, I, 
it, it evolved. I mean, literally, I, the, my, not so much what I'm doing, but how I'm doing it, how I'm saying it, the words I use. You know, I try and drive everything with brevity because the less I'm speaking, the more you're doing. And it's really, you know, I find the one right word versus the three so so words to describe what it is we need to do. And, and the delivery, really, and time management, of course, to get the maximum number of repetitions effectively, that's really what's changed. Not so much that I'm, you know, I've added or deleted things um, as far as actual technical subject matter. It's just, um, you know, what, how, how I'm installing the information, the explanations get better. So, I, and I try to do that constantly. You know, I, I, every course I try to do, I try to make it better than the previous course. Um, you know, and I've taught well over 300 ECQCs at this point. Holy shit. You know, that's a lot. That's a lot of rounds, that's a lot of, that's a lot of sim rounds expended. That's a lot of, that's a lot, that's a lot of potential gunfights I've watched. That's, that's a lot. Yep. Um, it, what, um... What part of your coursework would you teach to any good guy if you had the opportunity? Like, say if you had every good guy, uh, you know, in, in North America in, in a room together, what segment or what technique or concept would you teach all of them without, with no restrictions? It would absolutely be managing unknown contacts, mm. which would be uh, strategy templates. Uh, that I teach before all coursework on uh, awareness, avoidance, and deselection. That's absolutely what I would teach. Yes. Is that is it the part of your work that you're like kind of most proud of, or you just think it's the most um, like the most important? I think it's the most important. I really do, and I think it's one that's applicable across, across the broadest spectrum because it, it, it's the same work you do with don't carry weapons. You know, um, so uh, it, and it's the same exact thing, male, female, you know, weapons, weapons lists. It doesn't matter what country you're in, you know, the, the, the pre soul cues that I teach are, 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 you know, common throughout all cultural norms. It doesn't matter what language you're speaking, uh, it's, it's pretty much all the same. You know, that, that, that idea of criminal soul paradigm and how. You know, robberies, kidnappings, and carjackings occur with what, what they look like as they're building up and simmering. I think that information is the most important. The most important, yes. Has there any uh, has there been any moment like as a as a coach um, that made you reshape your training in a big in a big way? Like uh, like any feedback you got, any thing that happened that made you think like, oh, geez, like uh, you know, I should like you know go back to the drawing board or or just like make a big. In the early days, you know, there were there were quite a few. Actually, it was a student of mine who uh, in two thousand and four kind of gave birth to the rule of using the thumb pectoral index because I had a I had a very intuitive understanding of range and knew when I should be back at the thumb pectoral. But you know, obviously, you know, I'm dealing with less adept people in a lot of cases. Physically, they're gun guys. You know, a lot of them are older and things like that. One guy who was struggling said, I cannot figure out when I should be partially out there, when I should, should have it back. You know, I need some kind of rule. And in that moment, I said, okay, if you're close enough to touch this guy with your other hand, or if he's close enough to touch you, you should have the gun back at the pump at full index. Anything outside of that, is a appropriate extension based on proximity of threat. And what defines proximity of threat is at any point, at whatever level of extension you're at, as your fire is being presented forward, could you reach out and touch the gun? That's, that's how you gauge and define range. So it was a student's problem like that, you know, that, that begat that rule that became part of doctrine. So oh, 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 there have been quite a few moments. That's probably the most profound one. But there were quite a few moments like that where students, literally me working with them and them working with me and struggling in a moment, really, really built the doctrine of easy man. They really did. I noticed um, that like one of the 
one of the criticisms I would see of like the thumb pectoral index uh, is that well, people say, well, you know, you can't you can't get good hits. I'm like, well, fucking obviously, dude. But I mean, like, it's I think it demonstrates the the, the picture that people have in their head, maybe of of what their fight is going to look like versus. Shift gears based here. On, based on the time I have available, I'm going to try and install wrestling as a delivery system. And, and people can learn how to bolt on strikes after my course with somebody else. But I'm going to choose to use wrestling as a delivery system simply because people fall a lot less and they're a lot harder to knock down if I can keep them upright. At least they can get out and escape, hopefully. You know, so that was a that was another conscious change from 2004 to 2007 was the the shift towards Greco Roman wrestling as the primary delivery system in the Berlin plant. It's funny. Um... When I was looking at, uh, when I found that um, that picture of those of those guys, uh, like that old, like the picture from like the fourteen hundreds of those guys doing like the the open guard, like Tomoe Nage with the uh, with the knives in hand and stuff. When I found that, um, I can't remember what I was looking for. I think I was looking for pictures of like musketeer dueling or something like that. Um, but it's it's funny how many of those pictures. Um, and like old artwork, old manuals, and stuff like the volume of that stuff that has that depicts the men in contact with each other, even with weapons that are like a meter long, um, is like is overwhelming. Like it's not, it's like over fifty percent of it. You know what I mean? Like most of it is like I've got this picture of these two guys with the uh, with the rapiers or whatever, and even at that range, one guy's sticking the other guy through the head, and he's grabbing the other guy's. Um, hand and like uh, the little like wrist guard thing that's on the that's on the sword um so i think um it's it's definitely underestimated how that range closes when you're talking about literally a step between people you know like uh, people aren't going to stay at this like fencing range forever um and that's just that's just another idea that that's that it's easy to get about the way the fight is is going to look you know what i mean you know, and I, I tell people this in the coursework that if you, if you look at ancient military culture and you, if, if, if you look at the way their hand to hand is depicted in their artwork, if you look at hand to hand depicted by ancient Greece, Rome, uh, feudal Japan, yeah. what, what does it look like? You'll see basically it, you, you got guys who are wrestling. They are wrestling with weapons and they're trying to stay on their feet or knock another, another guy off his feet. They're imposing limb control and it, it looks startlingly like, it looks exactly like what we do in modern coursework at ECQC. So, you know, I, I think if wrestling has worked as a base for hand-to-hand combat for 7,000 plus years of humanity and killing, yeah. I don't see any reason okay, it's um when you think about wrestling it's it's uh the foundational martial art it's like the foundation of combat as well um like i i i don't think if we were to look at you know a cape, you know a, like old homo sapiens wrestling neanderthals or, or you know or fight you know tribal fighting back in you know like like 
13,000 BC or whatever. Um, I don't think you'd see those guys boxing it out. I think you'd see them with hands on each other in, in like a dirt circle. You know what I mean? Exactly. I think we it, would probably see two on one. Do you think um do you think the multidisciplinary tactician will always be like a fringe case almost like it doesn't seem to me that there's um that there's not a lot of I think now now more than ever with social media and, and the way the internet is and the dissemination of information it's easy for people to kind of like wake up a little bit but do you always do you see that the like the gun guys and the martial arts guys and and then there's the guys kind of in between do you think they'll always be like just in the middle of the Venn diagram and there won't really be a lot of pollination between the two, like in like a big sense? I think it will, yeah. I don't think it will ever, ever be huge in a macro sense. I think it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but compared to like Orthodox shooting or Orthodox martial arts, no, I don't think it'll ever be as big as those two, as, as those two segments are distinctly. I think, I think being a, a multidisciplinary practitioner will always be really, really niche. Because, I, I mean, it can be kind of consuming, you know, to, to get just basic competency in all these areas. A lot of people don't want to make a lifestyle out of this. You know? yeah. I'm not saying you have to, but it sure helps. At least if you do it for like three or four or five years, to really dive face first into shooting and wrestling and putting it all together and yeah. doing basic jiu-jitsu and getting your fitness right and, you know, uh, hooking up with Toastmasters so that you're a little bit more verbally adept. You know, I, I think putting all that stuff together warrants, you know, some in-depth study guided by training groups and formal coursework probably for, you know, five years. You know, a lot of people just don't. They're not going to do that. You know, they're kind of they're kind of drive-bys. I, I do get, you know, there's people who I refer to who come in and do coursework once and I never see it again. There's no problem with that. No big deal. I had a taste of it. Yeah. It's probably just not a good thing, but... Or they figured it was an, or they figured it was enough, maybe. Like, yeah, exactly. It's something they'll ever be, like, they'll ever really sell at, blending everything together. Probably not so much, you know. Yeah, a lot of guys probably aren't going to take it, take it on as like a as like an affectation. You know what I mean? Right. Well, I mean, here's another good way to look at it: how much easier is it to be an orthodox jujitsu guy than it is to be an MMA guy? Right. Right. Like the like the, yeah. your t your task load is, is so much less. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's it's funny. Um. Because I I I train with a lot of guys. Um. And in my Especially when I was doing, when I was doing it like a, a lot in my early twenties, and uh, there, you know, I, like I had my jujitsu friends and I had my Muay Thai friends, and they but they weren't the same guys. You know what I mean? It was like they would they would pick the they would pick the thing that they liked, and and uh, you know when I when I get bored of something or when I've done something for a while, I like to switch to something else just to keep things fresh. You know what I mean? Uh, so I was doing both and, you know, it, it would be, it would be the sort of thing where like, you know, like my buddy would give me shit when and he tapped me out and I'd be like, well, if we get, if we box, I'll fuck you up. But, um, not a lot of guys, I don't, I don't know if, um, there's, I, I don't know. It's like, uh, maybe they, people approached it from more of like the hobby perspective. Like they're just, and like a lot of them, you know, even at the suggestion of it, they would, they'd be like, no, I just, I just don't want to do it. You know, like guys, yeah. guys prefer the Muay Thai, and then they and they or they prefer the wrestling because you know they don't get they don't get hit, they don't lose a lot of brain cells, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and well, you know, Cody, if you think about it, man, the, the real ethos of the multidisciplinary tactician is always practicing what you suck at. Yeah. Um, and guys will always gravitate towards yeah. and embrace. What they're good at, versus yeah. what they suck at, you know, and that's. I think that's one of the things that really defines our community is that that ethos, that ethic of, you know, what I'm deaf here. I need to go get punched in the head for a while. Yeah, strike is good, but man, it's probably get down on me. I, I am screwed. I'm really need to get my jujitsu down. You know, the, the, the essence of being that that kind of guy is knowing. There's always some place that you're weak. 
Yeah. And understanding. I may be strong here, but I'm weak here. Yeah. And how do I how do I, how do I achieve if it's possible, how can I ever achieve some kind of clarity in all these areas? Yeah. You know? That's the that's the really um difficult part of this. You know, while you're trying to get your boxing and your jujitsu and your wrestling squared away, guess what? You're not shooting. Yeah. So that's got to be done too. Yeah. I think um, it's like it's uh, it's it's tough on the ego, but at at the same time, it's it's also more. I think it's more rewarding to do something that you that you're not good at and get more proficient at it. I think the 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 sensation of you know of that success you get. Um, like for the long, for the longest time I had really, really bad boxing and I was like, I was like ashamed of it. Like I wouldn't, I didn't like in Muay Thai, I didn't want to box anybody. I would just kick them or clinch them and knee them. And then, you know, I, I, I put my head down and I actually, and I, and I worked on it. I worked on, you know, I got, I, I tried to get over my fear. I mean, I, you, there'll always be that little bit of anxiety when I have to get punched in the head. But when I, when I reaped the rewards of working on something that I was bad at, I just, I, I loved it. Uh, and I, and I started wanting to do it all the time. Almost like I love, like I, I just love working hands now. Um, and I did, um, Cecil's immediate action pugilistics, like whenever it was 2013, you know, just doing stuff like that, just polishing up those, those weak points. It just, it's really, I mean, it sucks when you're doing it, but afterwards, you know, going through that, that that growth it's it's like it's so rewarding in comparison to just going and doing something that you're already good at you know it's the, uh, it's the love of always being a white dog man <laughs> you know? yeah it really is you gotta love, you gotta love being a white belt to be a really great multidisciplinary tactician you do you have to be okay with that you have to have a very strong strong sense of self and a, and a and an ego that can handle that, you know. And if you love it, if you love learning, if you love being a white belt, it, it's that, that kind of uh, almost sick point where you're like, God, I love being crushed. Dude, that guy won my belt. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, then you're, then you're kind of in the right place, man, for this kind of, for this kind of work. Oh, where do you think... Um just shifting gears real quick, where do you think medical skills sit on the hierarchy of things I should have? Or like the average yeah, person should have? I think that, see, that's great. That's a great thing you just brought up because I woefully doubt it and not current on I need to do a medical class next year. I have to. It's been five years plus. So if I've done any medical training and that stuff changes constantly, I think it's yeah. incredibly important. You're far more likely to be in a car crash than you are in a robbery. So, you know, dealing with, dealing with bleeding, penetrating trauma, things like that, I think that's incredibly important. I think it's huge. Speaking of uh, car crashes, um, and I know you got the I know you got that VCast uh, class. Um, can you tell me a little bit about it? Uh, because I I know you've got uh, EWO, ECQC, right. Amis, and VCast. That's, that's the last one. So I've got four open enrollment courses, and basically VCast is an acronym for Vehicle Combatives and Shooting Tactics, and it's my take on all things car. So we start off with, with what I like to call a little vehicle agility, where I teach you how to interact with the car in a way that you're just not used to interacting with, certain ways to open the doors, consistent ways to get out of the belt, uh, being comfortable getting into and out of the car in, in, in odd ways. Um, and then doing that during and, and, and um, after encroachment problems, you know, like parking lot tactics for lack of a better term. Yeah. And then that, that's the first portion. The second portion is shooting, every permutation of shooting from the interior to the exterior. Uh, the third portion is every permutation of getting out of the car and thinking about the car as some kind of object where something is better than nothing as far as between you and the coming fire. So using the car as a transitional point, I hesitate to use the word cover, uh, but using the car as a transitional point to get into or out of a fight. 
Uh, so we do that, and then we have an evolution that's contextualized for the average person where we simulate an auto accident to your fault, where you have a person that you're trying to uh, take care of, and you have two people who are in the car that you struck, and they can do whatever they do, just like kind of the two on one DCQ stage. Wow. So basically, a, basically like a vehicle based 2v1 yeah. for DCQ. So that's the, that's the, uh, that's the evolution. Then after that, we do uh, in-car fighting. I teach a four-hour um, dedicated module of fighting inside the vehicle, deploying guns and knives inside the car. And then uh, we work on, and then what we do is the last portion is kind of an admin on Sunday where uh, I allow everybody to actually shoot a vehicle and shoot through auto glass, both front and side, and see what their carry route does as far as deviation goes. And that, that pretty much wraps up the course. So Sunday nights are... Uh, Friday night is usually like two hours. Saturday probably goes from eight in the morning until about eight thirty or nine o'clock at night, and then Sunday we usually go from probably eight to four thirty. Also, it's actually like a three-day course, yeah. like uh, ECQC. Yeah, yeah, it's set up like ECQC. There's a Friday night, a full day Saturday, and a full day Sunday. Yeah. Same way. What um what prompted you to come up with that? Uh, coursework, like was there, um, like was did something like something in particular, or was it just like there's? A, did you identify a need for it? Um, you know, a lot of it was the existing student base not being functional and competent around cars, and, and guys who specifically, um, I did a course in New England, and I had a lot of people who trained with me quite a bit unable to apply their skills in and around cars. Hmm. And, and, and that hammered home to me what environmental considerations do to motor skills, do to strategies, and do to tactics. You know? And I knew that intuitively, but having so many failures when I decided to plug some vehicles into a bunch of different uh, you know, evolutions, Having so many profound failures, guys not getting out of the car when they needed to, guys not being agile getting out of the car, not using the car correctly, uh, allowing the car to channel them and split their attention between them and a loved one. It was really profound, you know, uh, but it was something I should have expected. And uh, it was really out of that, that course in New Hampshire that uh, the view of coursework came about as a necessity. When, you know, uh, I just decided, you know what, um, if you guys want me to, I can, I can put together a vehicle specific course, and everybody thought it was a good idea. Huh. Uh, and I spent about two years working on it before I premiered it open and open. What goes into the, um, like, your process for, for building new coursework? Because I notice you've, you've kept your, uh, your coursework really, really dense. Um, so when you, when you, add, like, I'm sure you've got ideas for new classes all the time, or, but they, they just never really get off the drawing board, or? It's hard right now, I'm telling you, it's hard right now, there are a couple of, I don't think I'm ever thinking to be a guy with like 10 different courses. Yeah. Um, but a couple of more vehicles that are going to be Nice. So we'll, we'll have absolutely no weapons work whatsoever. That's yeah. really not even allowed to be armed. You know, it's going to be talking your way out of talking your way out of being shot. You know, talking your way into this, talking your way out of that. You know, um, and and you know we'll, we'll probably draw from some pretty arcane disciplines. You know, uh, the pickup artist crowd. They have some things to offer that we're interested in. Uh, technical stand-up comedy has a lot of interesting things that we're looking at, but that, that's probably like two years down the road. But yeah, pretty cerebral. Process, yeah, exactly. Uh, my normal process for doing stuff is, is R&D, typically about 20 months. Um, and, and what I used to do was I used my own SWAT team as guinea pigs until I got the coursework probably, you know, 75 to 80 percent of where I thought it needed to be before I did a public beta. Yeah. And then based on a beta, preferably of existing students, once I ran, ran it through and time hacked it, 
you know, figured out what I didn't know, that, that I'm a little bit closer. You know, all coursework is rough in the beginning, at least rough when I want it, you know. Yeah. I, I, and you know how I want my stuff to be. I, I like very, very, very smooth and sequential and yeah. to make sense progression. Um, so the first, the first course I do compared to the 10th course I do compared to the 20th course or the 50th course, you know, it's all going to get better and better and better and better. And yeah. It's fine. It's just part of the process, you know. Um, usually after, I would say, the fifth time you've done something, I think you've got a pretty damn good handle on it. Yeah. But just, look, I don't know what to think, man. I, how many guys do you know uh, who have taught a single course that they do 50 times? Few. Very few. A single, a single piece of coursework, you know, before they get bored with it. You know, most guys I know, they may teach a course, a specific course. Let's say your course is called Handgun 101. Yeah. And you teach that course twice a month. And you do that for, you know, uh, a letter, all right? So that's 24 times a year. So probably after four years, okay, or let's say, let, let, let's say after two years, after two years of, of a consistent pace like that, you probably, probably have pretty good chance, probably have pretty good handle of what you're doing. Yeah. I think. Yeah, you probably own it by then. Uh, that kind of repetition, that kind of mastery to say really, really know what you're doing. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I can't tell you the difference between the first course and the 50th ECQC. The first ECQC and the 50th, it's profound, you know? Yeah. It's very profound. The difference between the 50th and the 100th, pretty profound. The difference between the 100th and the 150th, eh, not as profound. The difference between the 150th and the 200th, eh, little bit of shape. So, I mean, gradually, you know, there's less and less and less and less and less to take off. That yeah. Takes, that is frequency, and that takes tenure. Yeah. That takes time. Yeah, it takes, yeah, you got, you're just like slowly polishing away at, at those surfaces, yeah. right? Dehorning those edges, as it were. Yeah. Yeah, I'm far more interested in depth than breath. I'd yeah. rather have two or three things that I am concerned to be the best at in the world rather than a generalist. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm not a Walmart. I'm a bespoke operation. That's <laughs> the way I'm yeah. Yeah, I, there's there's something about the way you deliver the coursework that I've never felt like I needed to take notes. I, I don't know I don't know what it is about the way you you, do, you teach the course, but I mean like I've been to a lot of seminars. You know what I mean? Like I've been to a lot of yeah. seminars, even with even from people within like the the you know like the little like the TPI sort of mind trust. You know what I mean? Like I went to Cecil's um. Uh, it's like it's like CM1, like street boxing sort of thing. And I took a ton of notes for that. Um, probably just because probably just he's just like dropping so much information. Like, it, and it was like, to a lot of it was totally new. Um, but for some reason, I just never needed to take notes when you're, when, when you're teaching. I don't know if it's just the way you structure it um, or the way you just tell what needs to be told and nothing else. Um right. There's just, and like I mean like going to like a Roy Harris, you know, jujitsu seminar, right? Like it's like uh, like it's like a college course. You know what I'm saying? Like I'll come back with like 600 pages of notes, and I'm like, oh shit, and I forget it all by like the next week. Um, it's it's interesting the way like is there like a a conscious design philosophy that you use when you're building those coursework? Oh, yeah. Congruency and reductionism. <laughs> so, Everything. You know, if anything, I've looked at what I can get rid of versus add. How do I, how do I do more with less? How do I say, how do I, how do I connote something by, by, by saying less? You know, if anything, congruency and reductionism really drive how I construct curriculum and, and how I teach, you know, saying the right things and constructing the curriculum in such a way where well, there's really not that much left to say because I've eliminated everything else. Yeah. You know, and I do that, I, do that, I may do that pedagogically, I may do that Socratically, you know, as far as 
the way you guys learn, but I, I think I should set up circumstances to where, you know what, well, yeah, it makes that. That's what people say, well, and they, they quite often, they don't take notes, and they're like, well, I didn't feel like I needed to, because everything just kind of made sense. Yeah. You know, well, yeah, that's what you would do. Yeah, you know, I think that's, I think that's, that's the, litmus, the litmus test, and one of the things that, that, that somebody who strives to be elegant in their teaching is, is able to do, you know, it, it just flows and it just makes sense. And, you know, a lot of people clear it up when they, they, nobody asks the questions. And that really doesn't clear me up because I'm having a feedback now at this point. It's like, well, man, answer them all, you know? Yeah. I, I really didn't What's left to like, say? Right, like what's um, like what else need be said? As I were, you know, as uh, yeah, after that, there's really nothing else to be said. I notice you don't um really get bogged down. I mean, I haven't done Amis or Vcast, although I would love to do Amis. Like I, I've been so thirsty for that coursework. It's it's hard to host. You would be really good at Amis, Cody. I you would be very very good at it. You would have. A Good, good sense of it. I know you well enough to know that you you would very, very much enjoy the challenge of it, the challenges of that coursework, and you would execute very well. Like when I when, when I when I when I watch the videos and I and I and I read the like the the after actions and everything, like I get I like I feel this I feel the stress, you know. I'm like, oh wow, man, that sounds like a lot to like a lot to do. Yeah, it is. It is. Amos is a true tactics course, which I love, because I don't outright teach decision making so much as I give you parameters and I let you experience it. You know, and um, you know, there's really there's really no model to teach to, to teach decision making. It's best learned experientially, I yeah. think, with leadership and guidance. Yeah, like when you're teaching um Something cere some something cerebral like like moment to moment tactics. You, you can't really give people um, okay, like this is what you're gonna do exactly, and this is the black and white picture of what's gonna happen, and that sort of thing. Like it's got to be very very um, situationally based because there's a lot going on. Absolutely, I think you do really well in Amsterdam. I hope I was. <laughs> I'm always a. My gut tells me you would do very well. I'd like to watch you. Know, it's going to be fun. It's I would fun. like. I'm. I've got. I've got. I got big plans to do Amis one of these days. Like I would like. A, you know, when, when the money's there and uh, yeah. and I and I can make it happen. Like oh man, I mean you, you don't host. You only host it like three or four times a year, isn't that right? Yes. You know, I was going to say we should try. We probably we may do it for this year. Uh, we may we may have to do it uh, at Cecil's place next year. Nice. So, um, you know, we, we might, we, we probably need to get you in one at 17. Yeah, I, yeah, I would, I would, oh man, I, just, I love it. Like, I, like, the, like all the, all, everything that's going on in that course, you know, like anytime I look at something and it makes me feel a little, like a little fear, I'm like, oh man, that's, 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 that's how I know I should do it. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I know, it's fun. It's stimulating. It's challenging. Absolutely, dude. Absolutely. Um, that, uh, that, that kind of voice modulation, uh, like, you know, giving verbal commands sort of work, um, th that's, a, that's like a module in Amos, isn't it? Or is it just kind of like something that comes up? No, that's, that's a specific module in Amos, you know, uh, what I call the don't shoot yet, um, that's, that's a very specific module in Amos, yes, that's, that's all the first half of day two. Oh, wow. So it's been four hours devoted to, to imposing control as best as you can. Yeah. You know, the attempt at imposing control and, and figuring out what to do with the guy that you had quite made the decision to shoot yet. Nice. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, is there any, is there any coursework that you do where you where you really get into the gear sort of side of it? And like one thing I always noticed is that you don't really um, drag things down into like a, like you know, like Glock or nineteen eleven sort of conversation. Like it it seems to be like a tertiary concern to you for the most part with 
things like this. This is more kind of more important things to talk about, right? Like leave the leave the gear career stuff for the for the forums, and let's just talk about the the, yeah. the techniques. You know, there, there are sidebar conversations with me or other students. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, if a conversation, somebody wants to, to have a conversation about appendix carry, we can do that on a break. Yeah. You know, that, that's 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 not a conversation that, that really is pertinent to coursework. Uh, but, you know, we can have a discussion of pros and cons and conducts and whether or not holsters and, and the sidebar. That, but that's a, that's a distraction for yeah. the most part, at least in ECQC it is. Yeah, it can tend to be, that sort of thing can tend to become the people's focus because it's, 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 it's easy to get into, you know? Yeah. Like, everybody yeah. likes gear, everyone likes talking about it. Um, it can it can kind of drag things down like when you're trying to you know you want to talk about something heavy and and people want to talk about like what weapon mounted light they got sort of thing right right absolutely absolutely you know but it's one of those you, you can buy competency you know hey, everybody's focus is on gear because that's something they can buy it'll give them an edge at least in their mind yeah Is there any like big misconception about the gun and what it does for us? Like, what do you think the biggest you know, one is? I think the biggest misconception probably is um, that you'll point a gun at somebody and they will cower in fear. You know, sometimes that happens, but as often as not, that doesn't happen. And I think you know, if we remove I think most people, when they, they pull a gun, the expectation is like, you know, pointing a cross at a vampire. Yeah. He's going to just show, you know, he's going to cower and shrink and shriek and run away. And, and I call that hiding behind the gun. You know, if you can't project will and tension without, with the gun, you certainly can't do without. You know, so... That's, that's, that's really what you have to do, you know, especially if you're in that, that moment of not shooting someone yet, you know, you manage to not, you manage to preemptively get the weapon in hand and get it out before you're caught, you know, on the receiving end of fire or before you're on the receiving end of an assault. And if you get the gun out, there's a moment there when most people have an expectation of that breaking the assault. And if that happens, that's great. But be prepared for it not to, and be prepared for, you know, what, there may be a little test. Yeah. There may be a little test. So, hiding behind the gun, I think that's a, uh, that's a big misconception that, that people have, or the misconception being that somebody's gonna sh just going to shrink and tower with a point of muzzle. You know, if you break down in some nasty neighborhood, and some hood rat rolls around the corner while you're, you know, looking at your smoking radiator, and you point a gun at him, more than likely, that's not the only one he's ever had pointed at. Right. You know? Yeah, uh, probably your average citizen who goes through life, you know, the, although the only the only interaction they have that, that's stressful is like, you know, getting like a speeding ticket or something like that. Um, yeah. It's it's hard to put yourself in the position of somebody like, say, a career criminal or, or, or and that sort of thing who... Who's, who's seen guns before and probably seen, like, the muzzle end of one, you know? Yep. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. What's the biggest misconception about the knife, do you think? That it will immediately stop someone, you know? The vast majority of people that are stabbed or cut don't realize it. 
I think most people don't realize that, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting conundrum with blades because the vast majority of knives, the vast majority of stoppages with knives are, are psychological stoppages. People stop doing whatever it is that caused you to stab or cut them in the first place. Yeah. Stop doing that because they choose to. Now, here's the, here's the, the interesting thing. How do you predicate your, your method of application on the adversary's willingness to pitch up? You know? Right. And, and there's no way you can do that. So, so you know, anything we can do, probably a knife is at least quantifiable. There's no body of medical research that shows that one particular method of using knife is more effective than any other application. Yeah. You know, or any other method. So, the way I tell people is, you were in this until you've accomplished a couple of things. Either you've gotten this guy off of you, or once keeping him, once getting him off of you, you keep him off of you. That's what you're trying to do. And whether that occurs through blood loss, pain, uh, psychological induced stoppage, or, or you know, uh, biomechanically disabling his body, whatever it is, that's the instinct. That's the instinct. You were in it until it's done and understand that, that any particular method of doing that you know is, is highly suspect you may just have to stay on a guy it's a very you know if you look at prison footage you know we, we never see anybody going down for one shot yeah nobody ever goes down for one shot it's always 60 or 70 shots you know slashes stabs you know it's, it's very bloody aerobic event. And I think that's, I think the misconception people have about knife work, modern short bladed knife work, knives they actually carry, is that they're going to, you know, in a very um, gentlemanly way, pop a guy with a knife, pop back and twist their mustache, yeah. and the guy's going to spit on blood, you know, and run away shrieking. Yeah. He has superior skill. I, I, I guess you know, that's how, most, that, that's how most people envision this stuff. That's just, that's just not the case. It's a bloody, rolling around in pissed beer and broken glass on the, in the dirt, you know, tight, entangled, shacking. Yeah, basically. Uh, it is stuff looks. Yeah. The, uh, I remember um, on TPI, Larry said something that kind of shook me. Uh, about this and that, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but I, I remember just the, the message basically. Um, and he was saying something along the lines of it may, like, uh, in the end, like something like a, a blackjack could on paper be more effective because, I mean, if you knock the guy out, the fight's over. But, I mean, if you're sticking him, he's not, he's, it's, you're in it until, <laughs> until he stops under whatever condition, you know? Yep. And that really changed, that really changed my. I was like, fuck, I should, why didn't I think of that? You know? Like, it's yeah. just the sort of thing that somebody like me who doesn't, you know, who doesn't do this sort of thing would, I would just never think of it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Do you... I, I would far rather, you know, hit someone with blood trauma at the skull than poke them repeatedly at the torso. Yeah. You bl blunt trauma, you mean like with, with something in your hand or just in general? Uh, Preferably with something in my hand, something heavy. Yeah. <laughs> 13 ounce blackjack. <laughs> I feel that's far more decisive than projectable. Oh, shit. Uh, yes. I've got my, uh, I've got my foster jack sitting right here beside me at the, at the coffee table here. Oh wow! You know what? It's it changed my life. It really did. Actually, I've got two. I've got two from him, um, and and like this one's uh like a black head, black strap, and like a kind of like an olive green wrap on the body. Like it's oh man, <laughs> it's nice. It's a nice piece of equipment. I've got a bunch of his stuff. He just did the uh, he did me a table jack, and kind of a cordovan color, and then he did me a uh, he did me a black and tan. And they both are right at about 13 ounces. Man. Oh, they were, uh, stunning. They were the only, you know, they were like Thor's hammer. <laughs> exactly. I think I think this one's only uh, I think this one's only 10. It might be 12. I'm not. Uh, I don't have that many to compare it to. So I mean, I think 
I mean, I would, I would definitely hit somebody with it though. Like, I got no, yeah. I got no issues about what it would do. Like, even if yeah. you just, even. Yeah, I mean, honestly, though, you, you wonder about what a guy can do. You don't wonder about what a blackjack can do. As far as stopping someone. Yeah. But yeah, you cut pigs and things like that. You can see the damage, but it's like, oh, you know, is that. You're going to shut somebody down. You, you know, you see a blackjack in the palm of your hand, you picture what somebody in the head with, you're like, yeah, that, that, that would be true. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, uh, he's going to be changed. He's going to be changed forever when I hit him with this, you know? Pretty much. Like, Pretty much. Come on, folks, for Christmas, I think it's what the Foster's saying. Yeah, exactly. Like, we'll, we'll be keeping him in the garage in a wheelchair after this. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I don't I don't wanna bog you down with too much more. Um I think I had the maybe like one more relevant question to ask and then I'll let you go. Um uh, oh right, what's what's the uh, what's the origin of the of the of the Shivworks logo? You know, uh, there was really a, it was an artist dude who came along and started doing a Yeah, it is cool. Like it's just dope. Yeah, nothing more than that. It's not. It's not symbolic, or, you know. The, like there's no like design philosophy sort of thing. Yeah. No, no, there's nothing symbolic. It's just a standing with logo that one artist did came up with. Yeah. So, there we go. And, and, and I'm very satisfied. It was cool. Yeah, I, I think it's um, it really like it really stands out. It's so simple. Um, like you, you, you see it, you know exactly what you're looking at, right? Like it's, 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 it's yeah, did a good job. It's, it's effectively iconic, you know. I mean, it's not quite Apple iconic, but it, it's pretty iconic at this point. It, I, I like the logo, but you know, I wish I could say there was a cool story, you know, on, on, you know, represents X, Y, and Z in my life of the blade represented, but there, there's that, that'd be bullshit. There's no story behind. We have to do those. I was talking to um, I was talking to Paul, uh, like Paul Sharp. Uh, I was talking about like uh, the, the 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 fight before the weapons come out. I was like, uh, Paul, should we focus on um, getting a dominant wrestling position, bef- like for like you know slipping to the back and getting that sort of thing before anything even happens, like before the the knives or the guns come out. Or should we knock him out if possible? And he was like, yeah, just, if you can, just knock his ass out. Or at least hurt him enough that it makes his job dealing with you very hard when the weapons do come up. And I was like, oh, shit, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah, Paul's got plenty of real Yeah. Yeah, he's, a, he's, he's pretty real. Pretty real. Um, okay, uh... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's yeah, like I said, he's a he's a really good resource for for everybody, I think. Um two more. We've got one one dumb question and one uh one reasonable one. So uh when you when you talk about martial arts and you get into like the gun stuff and the tr- and training and all that, like you kind of get that like that like a uh, I can't remember what Ratty Ratty Ferguson called it. He said it was like a although the halo effect, um, and then like the the whole hero worship thing. Um, do you ever worry that like one day, not not that you'll fall into that trap, but you'll get enough people behind you that it'll become like that for them, like they they won't be able to see past what you do. And it's something, I, something I think about, and, and you know, I've got a very I've got a very good group of centered friends where we, we rip on each other constantly, yeah. you know, and, I, and it kind of, it kind of self-polices and, um, you know, just having honest conversations with, with people, you know, about this and, and understanding what, but, and I think also, you know, a lot of things can happen to me in undercover work, you know, where, where, you know, a lot of my ego all cost me my life, um, I have the illusion about being uh, some kind of superhero, you know? And, yeah. And you've heard me say before, nobody wears a cape. Yeah. Nobody's infallible, you know? And, um, you know, 
you know, I, I'm going to keep working hard and, and make sure that people remember that, you know, at, at the end, it's not about me, okay? Don't make this about me. Make this about, you know, uh, the, the journey and the quest for excellence and, and good work, you know? I, I, I'm constantly, you know, and that's, that really is catching on, you know? Um, I had a lot of people who were very loyal, but, but they don't deify me, you know, and they will quickly say if they suspect something is not done, and I have to do diligence, they'll ask, they'll say, hey, how much have you worked in this, you know, <laughs> I, I like that, I mean, I, I, it's a very, uh, it's what a collegiate environment should be. And yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm and I, and I, like, I really like that, I really like that, it keeps me sharp and fresh. You know, uh, I don't want to coast, you know, on reputation or prior work. Yeah. And of course, continue to seek and search, you know? Yeah, like, uh, you got to have your, uh, you know, your circle audit each other, basically. Yeah. Like, yeah, we, we saw, we saw audit and, and we saw police. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, but absolutely. Yeah, yeah, there's really no, there's no hierarchy. There's just who's being paid attention to for the moment. And that could be me paying attention to you an hour from now. Yeah. You know, that's how I think about it. Because whoever's not the floor in the moment is, you know, that's who we listen to. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, last question. Uh, what's your favorite drink? Uh, yeah, just beverage or spirit? Like, uh, spirit. Spirit. Wow. You know... I like to drink, Cody, as you will. <laughs> I know, I know, buddy, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to say, probably uh, scotch, a good scotch. Nice. Still number one with bourbon being a close second. Nice. Uh, it's hot right now, it's in the south, so like if, I, if it's during the day, I tend to trend towards light spirits, like the big thing I like, gin tonics during the day, if I'm a drink during the day. Uh, the, 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 the brown booze doesn't come out until, you know, after hours. <laughs> gotcha. I'm not much of a gotcha bourbon during the day. Now, we will drink the Texas that. If I were at the Kentucky Derby during the day, I most assuredly would drink, you know, um, what's, the, uh, what's, what's the, the classic cocktail I'm trying to think of? Uh, Mint Julep. I most assuredly, which has a lot of bourbon, and I most assuredly would drink a brown drink during the day at the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I I do I do enjoy um, a cheap rye. It's just something about it. A cheap rye, a cheap rye, nice. Okay. <laughs> like um, rye, uh, like rye up here is really popular. Like there's like like the like the the, the, the rack of rye, um, you know, at at, the, at a Canadian liquor store is like is is pretty big. So, uh, so I've been drink I actually been drinking a lot of that myself. Um. Yeah. I remember we had uh, mint juleps at uh, at the at the Bourbon House in uh, Portland. Yeah. Before I think it was bef I think it was bef it was before uh, Edge Weapons. Yeah. <laughs> with uh, with Chris and Rich. Yes, we did. That was a good place, man. They had all kinds of good It was yeah. It was really good. I've, I'll I'll never forget it. I don't think. Yeah. I'm, well, there's a uh, one yeah. thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They have with their, you know, with with their their metrosexualism as much as they have with They usually do cocktails really well. Yeah, it's I think it's that um that artsy artsy flair they have, you know, just kind of taking it to that next level. Yeah. I um. Kids or kids like that usually have one thing that they do way better than it has any right to be. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, and William, William Abel was actually the guy that figured that out. You know, if, if you can find what it is, it's usually pretty damn well done. It doesn't matter what it is. But there's something they 
do is get into it and do like freakishly, freakishly good. Nice. So that's the trick. There's um there's something about hanging out with the guys before after, during a class, that just, like, it has this air of, like, a like a Greek symposium, you know what I mean? Like, we, you know, we, we, we got these, we got these, like, we, yeah, we got these, like, the, the mature philosophers hanging around, drawing the, drawing the guys into the conversation and everything, like, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's an all-around enriching experience. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an, it's, it's definitely an, it's, it's an unapologetic expression of, uh, of male primarily fellowship. There's no girls are allowed. Yeah. You know, it's very, it's very egalitarian. I mean, everybody suffers, everybody performs or doesn't. Everybody knows how the other guy did and you can't fake it, man. And yeah, absolutely. It's, it's probably as close to a meritocracy as we can get. So it's, it's very, very cool, man. It yeah. really is. Yeah, and like... It's plus lasting friendships and, and relationships. And yeah. Mutual respect. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, there's there's just nothing quite like it. You know, yeah. like, and like when you... Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, you, you just can't, um, you just can't do that sort of thing with somebody and not just like step to them afterwards and be like, man, you, you did a great job, you know? Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. It tends to truly be a... Uh, a douche-free zone. Yeah. You can't douche that and get trained like that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, Craig, um, I'll let you go because I've already had you for like an hour and a half, something like that. So I right, bro. I just no, want to say again, yeah, thanks so much for, for answering all these questions and taking the time. Thank you for, uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you for having me. It's been, it's been far too long. We've uh, been able to talk and spend a little time together, so man, I appreciate it. I really did. Yeah, dude. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, Cody. Yeah, brother. I'll talk. I'll talk to you soon.